excellencies, distinguished guests, and participants. On behalf of UN Women, FAO, IFAD, WFP, and the CEDA, which is the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency, I would like to welcome you most warmly to um, this virtual event, partnering, partnering for Change, Holistic Approaches to Rural Women's Economic Empowerment. My name is Simi Kayum. I am UN Women's Acting Chief for Economic Empowerment, and I will be moderating this event today. I'm very, very pleased to share with you uh, the global evaluation findings and key results from the six-year UN, UN joint program Accelerating Progress Towards the Economic Empowerment of Rural Women. This is a unique partnership between FAO, EFAD, UN Women, and WFP, and it is generously supported by Sweden and Norway. Um, we are honored today to have a number of distinguished speakers and experts joining us for the session. We will include in the session a series of lightning talks on the key findings and reflections from the key outcomes of this global evaluation. And we will also have interactive dialogue with panelists. Following this, we'll have a question and answer session. And please do use the question and answer function at the bottom right of your screen to submit your questions in writing. Um, we will compile the questions and ask panelists to respond during the Q&A portion of today's session. And in addition, please do use the chat function if you would like to share your experiences and reflections on the economic empowerment of rural women. And in this way, you will be able to share them for all to see and for others to engage in dialogue with you. Before we go on to the opening speaker, please be informed that translation is available in French and Spanish through the translation function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please do click on the language that you wish to hear the interventions in. Uh, we would also like to point out that today's session um, will be recorded and will be made available on the joint programs YouTube channel. And now it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce the World Food Program's Deputy D Executive Director, Amir Mohammed uh, Abdullah, to open the event. Good uh, afternoon, good morning, good evening, everybody, depending where you're following this from. Rural women play a critical role in agriculture, food security, and nutrition. They build climate resilience, manage land and natural resources. But many rural women suffer from discrimination, systemic racism, and structural poverty. So back in 2014, the Rome-based agencies and UN Women launched the joint program on accelerating progress towards the economic empowerment of rural women. Right there on the eve of the Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals. This joint program was the first example of the Rome-based agencies, RBAs as we know them, and UN Women joining forces and combining our knowledge, expertise, and strengths to work to secure the livelihoods and rights of rural women. Today, we will all hear about the results achieved, the differences this joint program has made in bringing change to over 80,000 rural women and over 400,000 of their household members. These women, you know, they are based in Ethiopia, Guatemala, Kyrgyzstan, Liberia, Nepal, Niger, and Rwanda. The joint program has created an enabling environment for rural women's empowerment, and it tackles systemic and structural barriers which stand in the way of gender equality. It succeeded through the commitment of our agencies and especially the hard work of those on the ground. The joint program has made a significant contribution to rural women's lives. For instance, 
through the transfer of knowledge and capacity development. We've seen huge increases in production by rural women, which has enhanced nutrition and food security and provided a basis for income generation. Rural women who have never before had a culture of being able to save or even had access to credit now have household savings, which has enabled them to make choices, not least in providing life chances to their children, such as enabling them to go to school, which is critical to breaking the cycle of poverty. We've seen through this program that by acquiring basic literacy and numeracy skills, a world of opportunity can be opened up and serve as a foundation for women to become entrepreneurs, leaders, and decision makers. Critically, the program has worked with local communities to, to really shift deeply entrenched restrictive social norms and has brought about unprecedented change to the everyday lives of rural women and their families. And something not just of paramount importance, but actually very close to my heart, we have brought men with us. And in many of the communities that we work in, we have witnessed men championing the cause of women and supporting their partners to become agents of change. Across all countries participating in the joint program, the evaluation has found that women have increased confidence, self-esteem and status within their households and communities. Our partnership with stakeholders at national and local level has been key to these achievements in alignment with national policies on gender equality and women's economic empowerment. We've also developed innovative private sector partnerships, which have opened up opportunities for women and provided them with skills in digital literacy and other such things. Finally, and I would like to say thanks here, without the support of our key partners, Sweden and Norway, these achievements would not have been possible. We are delighted to have this occasion today to jointly host this event with CEDA, a true champion of gender equality whose support has enabled us to pilot this innovative program and will spur us on to further develop and scale up this program. In closing, we should be reminded that the COVID-19 pandemic has affected more than half the world's women farmers with restrictions on movement, the closure of shops and markets and disruption to their supply chains. Combined with challenges, these challenges, including increased unpaid care and domestic work, rising rates of gender-based violence, rural women are bearing some of the heaviest burdens of the pandemic. So today, let's renew our commitment to rural women in all their diversity, increase our efforts to support them through the COVID-19 panic, pandemic and beyond and work with them to build their resilience to future crises. Some of you may have heard me say in the past that I believe that for each man-made problem we have a woman-led solution and I'm fully confident that rural women will bring us many of the solutions we desperately need today. So thanks to all of you for listening and attending but my special thanks and recognition go to all rural women in the world. We owe it to them to scale up this joint program. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Amir, for those uh, very inspiring words, um, pointing out the challenges that rural women and their communities have faced um, everywhere in the world, the challenges that this joint program has tried to address through, as you say, women-led solutions on the ground, working with multiple partners, governments, civil society, private sector, and not least facing the challenge of uh, the global pandemic and uh, coming through it with new solutions and new approaches. Thank you very much indeed for opening this event with such um, uh, words of wisdom and of the potential of this program to carry 
on in a expanded and scaled up fashion. So thank you again. And now I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker from the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency, Deputy Director for the Department for International Organizations, Eva Lovgren. Thank you so much and uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon or good, good evening, depending on where you are on the globe. Um, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of SIDA, the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency, I thank you for, for being given the opportunity to hold the keynote speech at this very important event. We, we are living through very challenging times. Uh, we have the current global health and economic crisis following the COVID-19 pandemic, and that is affecting us all. Uh, but of course, it has a disproportionate effect on people living in poverty, and especially women and girls. The pandemic is threatening years of hard-won economic gains and social gains for women and girls. And in the last year, we have seen women facing disruptions in income and education, losing access to essential services and inputs, and facing greater risk of being dispossessed of land and property and, and facing disproportionate care burdens. For women already living in poverty, these impacts can be a shock to their overall economic stability. A priority theme, a thematic area in Sweden's development cooperation is inclusive economic development where women's economic empowerment is a key element. Sweden's feminist foreign policy has taken global leadership on women's economic empowerment, and Sweden is co-leading the Global Action Coalition for Economic Justice for the coming five years, following the UN Secretary General's call for a decade of action to reach the SDGs. CEDA has supported the joint program since its inception in 2014. The holistic and joint approach to strengthening uh, rural women's economic empowerment under the UN Delivering, Delivering as One was innovative in its deception and, and it still is. Given the situation we are in today, this is more important than ever. As said earlier, the pandemic comes with several risks of backlashes in women's economic and women's economic empowerment and women's empowerment overall. We also see the climate change and loss of biodiversity can seriously affect women living in rural areas. So women's empowerment and resilience financially, socially, environmentally is an obvious priority. We are pleased to see the final evaluation of the first phase of the program and look forward to this opportunity to hear about results and learnings. In the program, contextual solutions have been tested and developed across the seven countries and local learnings feed up to global program level. Importantly, there has been a strong ownership among all partners, not the least the governments in the program countries. And this is a prerequisite for achieving policy changes that are truly gender responsive and transformative. The program holds a unique opportunity to spread lessons learned and inform interventions and efforts, strengthening women's economic empowerment beyond the program itself to international non-governmental organizations, civil society organizations, governments and donors. For an example, for example, the Committee on World Food Security is currently developing voluntary guidelines on gender equality and women's empowerment, which Sweden is supporting. And the uh, Committee on World Food Security process could hopefully benefit from the experiences from the program. And we hope that there will be opportunity for that to happen. Today's event is another brilliant example of how learnings can be shared 
it is clear that the program has built a foundation on which proven methods for strengthening women's economic empowerment can be replicated and scaled. And now we stand ready to build on what, what works. And CEDA strongly believes that now is the time for continued and boosted support to women's economic empowerment. We are hopeful and we urge that additional partners and donors will join the new joint program on rural women's economic empowerment so that we can continue uh, to expand this imp very important work. So with these few words, I'd like to thank you and look forward to, uh, to the rest of the event. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed, Eva, for a keynote that comprehensively um, sets the stage for today's discussion and for uh, situating this joint program, with, which, as you mentioned, was unique in its inception and continues to be unique today as we are in different um, but still challenging times, particularly in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, but also responding in a positive way to the Secretary General's decade of action, to um, the imperative of, uh, of, of, of building on women's economic empowerment to achieve the inclusive economic growth and development, which is a priority for your country and for all countries in the world. So thank you very much again for your remarks. And um, I would like to thank Sida uh, and also Norway, NORAD, who were unfortunately unable to join us today for their invaluable uh, partnership over these many years for enabling the excellent evolution of this joint program together with our many partners, not least, as you have said, national governments, but uh, women's organizations, civil society organizations, and others on the ground. And now I would like to turn to um, uh, looking at the results of the Partnering for Change and the integrated holistic approaches which have allowed us to achieve these results in the joint program. So now I am very delighted to introduce Beatrice Gurley, who is the Gender Targeting and Social Inclusion Specialist at EFAD and a member of the Global Joint Program Technical Committee, and Ramon Garway, the Joint Program National Coordinator in Liberia for UN Women, who will present a series of lightning talks and guide us through the key results of the evaluation findings under the four outcome areas of this joint program. So now I would like to uh, turn to Beatrice to take us through the key results under the first outcome. Beatrice, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Samin, and very happy to be here today with such a wide group of people and to have the opportunities to share uh, some of the good results that the joint program has yielded during uh, these years of partnership. Um, so as mentioned by uh, Ms. Eva Lovgren and Mr. Amir Abdul, this program is really unique in its kind. And because of this, um, the implementation generated a goldmine of useful information on programmatic strategies for the empowerment of women, but also for you know, future initiatives that might want to adopt a similar partnership uh, um, model among UN agencies. Um, next slide, please. First of all, I would like to quickly recall what are the key um, outcomes of the joint program on rural women economic empowerment. The first one relates to food and nutrition security. And the program dealt with it by increasing the productive potential of women smallholder farmers through ensuring their access to and control over um, productive resources and services that are critical to food security and nutrition. The second outcome is increased incomes to sustain uh, livelihoods. And this focuses on supporting rural women's livelihood strategies by enhancing their income opportunities, supporting women-led entrepreneurship, and promoting women linkages to high value markets. The third outcome 
uh, is enhance leadership and participation in decision making in communities and rural institutions, as well as household level. Um, this involved working with also men, so to guarantee their political and social support uh, um, in promoting the role of women uh, also within the whole community. And the last one, uh, the last outcome is gender responsive policy environment for the economic empowerment of rural women. And with that, uh, we dealt with catalyzing uh, legislative and policy reform for the effective enforcement of rural women rights and opportunities. So these four outcomes really clustered project interventions with the intention to shape up a holistic approach that recognizes and responds to the multiple challenges that rural women are confronted with. And the underpinning idea was to generate more effective and long lasting changes through this comprehensive approach. Next slide, please. Um, the program followed a specific targeting approach abiding to the principle of leaving no one behind of the agenda 2030. Um, in general, overall, the joint program focused on women in greatest needs in food insecure areas where the four agencies were active or where they had a substantial track of implementation experience. Of course, there were some um, specific features in the targeting strategy in relation to the different countries. So uh, just to provide you with some concrete examples, Guatemala placed a very uh, strong emphasis on indigenous women, compounded with a very specific geographic focus in the Valley of Polochic. Um, Nepal's targeted area instead dealt with very diverse subset of beneficiaries that included Terai and Hill communities, Muslim, uh, Buddhist, and Hindu communities, as well as Dalit people. Rwanda instead focused on the socially marginalized, including those living with HIV AIDS and survivors of gender-based violence. So again, um, the joint program really focused on the specific needs of women in each of the different countries where it has been implemented. Next slide, please. Um, in order to take stock of the joint program results, the joint program team or teams, right, both at country level and, um, and global level, engage in multiple exercises of reflection. We engage in an internal stock take as a moment of reflection among um, joint program stakeholders. There are ongoing project end lines that are using um, the um, Women Empowerment in Agriculture Index, uh, partnering with IFPRI. Uh, and then what Semin already announced, uh, an external independent decentralized evaluation that was carried out by an evaluation company under WFE Quality Assurance System. The evaluation covered six years of implementation starting from October 2014, when activities started in the field um, up to October 2020 and adhere to the UN evaluation group guidelines, norms and standards for evaluations and where it was guided by the um, OECD DAC evaluation criteria. The, 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 the evaluation methodology combined the collection and analysis of both primary and secondary data at global and country level and used a variety of evaluation tools that you can see listed on the slide on the screen. So what uh, Ramon and I are going to do today is to quickly walk you through some of the key qualitative results that the evaluation um, provided to us. Next slide, please. The evaluation singled out some of the key distinctive features of the joint program, and in particular that it is a flexible, replicable, replicable and scalable model um, that was contextualized for each country of implementation. The program pursued a <clears throat> twin track strategy, focusing on short, medium and long term results. It built a lot of partnerships not only among UN agencies as a programmatic fundament of the program, but also with governments, with local civil society and um, development uh, research institutions at global level. 
The program also tried to address the root causes of gender inequalities, such as discriminatory social norms, and relied a lot on participatory approaches. In general, the program used uh, um, groups as privileged entry points to communities and focused on the development of capacities at individual, collective, and institutional level. Next slide, please. With what concerned the first um, outcome, so the first set of results um, uh, that I described before, so in relation to improve food security and nutrition, um, I would like to first of all quote uh, a very nice sentence um, that our uh, that a woman called Pashupati, one of our uh, program partner in the field in Nepal, has told us. What she said is that uh, we eat more vegetables than before. Children are not falling ill frequently. We spend less money on treatment because we learned and use good hygiene and balanced diet. And I think this summarizes quite nicely the results in this area because what the joint program did in this area is to recognize healthy nutrition status as the foundation for building empowerment. The access to nutrition services and training did improve um, the nutrition level of the household and enhance overall food security of its, um, of its members. The increases in vegetable and livestock production, diet and nutrition were actually evidenced across all the countries by the evaluation. And the diets in particular improved as a result of the availability of eggs and meat from livestock and poultry production, but also from homegrown produce in the kitchen gardens. And we had different interesting experiences about that um, with some concrete data on the nutrition improvement of our beneficiary population in Niger. Rwanda and Kyrgyzstan. As mentioned by our uh, beneficiary, less expenditure on health services to improve nutrition enabled more disposable income for um, expenditure on food or other items, including school fees for children. Next slide, please. The program provided small livestock also, um, compounded with technical trainings on how to manage it and how to increase production, such as, for instance, the rural pastoral kits in Niger or chicken gardens in Rwanda that we mentioned before. And this resulted into better nutrition through greater availability of either dairy products or uh, chicken meat. Women also adopted various improved production technologies, leading to increases in agricultural productivity and hence food availability. Women also reported using um, savings and credits uh, from their cooperative groups to buy additional land that also helped them to uh, increase their production. And lastly, this uh, led to investment in assets, which helped to connect to markets and provided more income generation opportunities. I'm reading that we perhaps lost uh, our colleague Ramon. So if you don't mind, I'll continue walking you through the results, but I'll jump to outcome three. So the results under outcome three related, and if possible, it would be great to have, uh, uh, to have the related PowerPoint, but I'll start describing what have been the changes under this outcome that relate mostly to changing social norms and transforming gender roles. So, so really going at the roots of the gender inequalities and trying to address those. Um, among the most interesting strategies used by the joint program um, to change social norms and transform gender roles, we find the uh, Dimitra Listeners Clubs in Niger, the Community Conversations, and the Gender Action Learning System methodology that was used in Rwanda, Kyrgyzstan, and Nepal. So these methodologies um, that really characterize the program not only provided safe spaces for dialogue at community and household level, but also provided concrete tools to act upon limiting social norms and initiate gender transformative changes. What is interesting to note is also that these approaches engage men and the wider community in not only participatory learning dialogue and creating spaces to analyze uh, gender-based issues at household and community level, but they also provided tools to act upon these inequalities. So both men and women were in the driving seat when developing joint strategies or when negotiating pathways of change. 
And this really helped to, uh, to, to, to manage power dynamics and because designing together led to win-win solutions that did not make men feel that the empowerment of women would be detrimental to their own. Evidence also showed that this contributed to changing gender relation um, at household level, with men being more involved in household chores and women being more involved in decision making over different aspects of, uh, of their productive and reproductive life. These findings were actually uh, also confirmed by two ongoing independent qualitative studies that are analyzing uh, the results of the gender action learning system in Kyrgyzstan and Nepal. So reinforcing basically the findings of the evaluation. Uh, the evaluation also found that women leadership and participation became more acceptable even at community level and contributed to amplify women's voices as highlighted by an in-depth case study of the evaluation in, uh, in Niger. And referring to what I mentioned um, before about the use of groups as entry points uh, for the program, I would like to describe some of the interesting changes generated by the use, uh, um, by the use of groups as entry points. So, um, because it was found to be really key for changing gender roles. And the evaluation noted that self of groups uh, acted as social networking instruments for local women to join and advocate for their rights, to access resources, to voice their opinions. And this became very clear, for instance, in Niger, where the Dimitra clubs uh, provided a powerful space for men and women to listen to each other. Also, um, groups uh, were really conducive to acquire social skills and basic life skills, such as I don't know, basic literacy and numeracy that bolstered women's leadership capacities and reduced gender bias in both households and communities. And as a result, women said that they have more confidence in taking out loans, acquiring formal land rights and developing a business. Something that was also found across uh, most of the country programs is that participants reported enhanced self-esteem in relation to interventions that were delivered through groups. So capacity building, leadership training, and also the simple fact of having an occasion where to practice um, their leadership skills. So the concept of leadership for what, um, and to practice there for decision-making. The evaluation reports uh, uh, that in all countries there, is, there was also a significant increase in women's social and interpersonal skills. So women claim to be more comfortable to speak, share, educate themselves on farming and nutrition, to manage household finance, to take out loans, acquire again formal land rights. And um, just to quote you a couple of examples, in Nepal, women reported gaining confidence in basic actions such as signing their names, making agricultural decisions, or deciding over household spending. Um, social change also happened within the household, which was a very important dimension for um, the joint program. The husbands uh, of the women participating in the program reported taking on increased roles in household chores, and this resulted into uh, freeing up women, women's time to either engage in economic activities or simply free up their time for increased well-being. Men also reported that their wives were uh, more confident in taking on new tasks or new initiatives uh, within the community and sought um, additional education opportunities for farming business or for earning money or simply improving their livelihoods. Uh, next slide, please. Great, thanks. Um, and again, on the role of groups, uh, um, women's increased income and economic contribution to the household uh, and their display of increased confidence really contributed to uh, an increased status within their communities, which is very important because um, the joint program really looked into how to uh, support women's leadership and decision-making capacity from the household 
up to the community and political level. So really developing an empowerment pathway across these different dimensions. Um, membership in group cooperatives complemented the individual efforts um, by supporting women's leadership in the wider community. Member of community groups noted that they felt more able to participate and voice their concerns in community development councils precisely as a result of their activities within the group as a sort of a training to then engage in a wider group, which is a community. This has led to growing support in the community for the improvement of women's status within, um, within the village. Next slide, please. And, con and keeping on um, in this leadership pathway, building on this point um, related to the community level, I would also like to describe um, results on women leadership on local level, including how uh, the joint program beneficiaries uh, uh, managed to gain positions in farmer groups, leadership positions in farmer groups, cooperatives, producer organizations, and local, local governance systems. So um, what the evaluation noted is that women participated in local elections and were elected to positions in local councils and decision-making bodies. And just to give you some interesting example, um, in Nepal, women were elected onto ward councils. In Kyrgyzstan, uh, women that had benefited from girls and other technical trainings provided through self-help groups run for local councils. And out of the 29 women that had received this type of training, 32 were elected actually in such councils and became active member in, uh, in the leadership of their communities. So women in Guatemala, Kyrgyzstan and Nepal are also were also sought to be participating in local level planning and budgeting process. In Ethiopia and Liberia, over 3,000 women became members of land communities. In Niger, 32 women participated in land commissions across different municipalities. And also in Liberia, um, the program saw a huge increase in rural women's participation at community level as superintendents, direct commissioners, and town chiefs. So uh, I'll wrap it up here. And if Ramon is available, I'll hand it over to him. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Beatrice. Uh, so I'll wait on the presentation. Uh, sorry about the cutoff. Uh, we had Wi-Fi issues in the country office, but I'm happy to be here and I bring you greetings from the Liberia country office uh, in UN Women and the rest of the family with FAO, World Food Program, and our government counterparts. Uh, I would like to now talk about what the global evaluation found out in, in Liberia and across the other countries, uh, the case of increased income, increased savings, and the case for diversified income generation. Uh, we do know that these were achieved as, uh, as a result of the combination of strategic uh, approaches, and these included the case of uh, the provision of capacity and skills development. Uh, we do know that this happened at the individual and the collective uh, level. Uh, this included life skills, business skills, literacy, numeracies, uh, management and leadership training. But of course, the whole case around access to credit uh, for both formal and informal. And of course, looking at the village savings and loan associations approach, uh, mostly in Guatemala, Liberia, and Rwanda. Uh, and of course, the three year period in Guatemala in terms of the savings that grew from 12,000 across 26 groups to 106,000 across 46 groups. Um, we also saw the case for agri-technologies. Uh, for example, there was milk processing uh, for pastoralists in the Afar region in Ethiopia. Uh, this basically uh, transformed uh, livelihoods in that area and has enabled the women there to uh, set up a milk supply business. Um, this has become, uh, become very well known and, and is used by local businesses in that area. Uh, in terms of uh, looking at how local extension services and planning processes has happened across the countries, we do see in Nepal that the local government has started uh, including women in their plans uh, for provision of agriculture inputs uh, through the involvement of extension system. Uh, on access to markets, we do see that the buyer from women in Pakistan has linked women uh, to local level, national level markets. But of course, looking at the P4P program, 
which has also given small uh, scale farmers a chance for long term uh, sustainable markets. In Liberia, the Buy From Women is about to kick off and uh, we will focus on uh, linking the joint program beneficiaries to information finance and markets. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and uh, looking on uh, the countries uh, that were evaluated, um, we were able to identify three, uh, basically two factors that, that are critical to uh, triggering uh, change. We've been able to see the formation of groups, uh, the dissemination of uh, new agricultural technologies, uh, basically around time saving and increased production. Um, we know that working in groups have provided the entry point uh, for subsequent interventions. And we know that this has fostered reflection and of course the dialogue between women. Uh, on the case of uh, the process of gradual uh, economic autonomy, we do know that we women are now owning their own cash. They're able to show more value at the household level because they are participating in decision-making, but they're also contributing to household expenses in the case of the payments of school fees, medical, food, et cetera. They have been able to provide in that area. We also know that uh, through gaining new skills, uh, there have been employment opportunities for women uh, with the particip participation of the socioeconomic activities that they are going through and of course enhanced decision-making roles. So we do see that their participation in land committees, for example, in Liberia, taking on leadership roles to discuss issues around land rights, uh, the environment and, and concession agreements that are affecting women in, in, in concession areas around land issues. And of course, the case of uh, increased respect at the household and at the community level. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so one other thing we were able to know, found out was that there has been a strong uh, uh, finding across all of the countries uh, with consideration for sustainability. And this has to do with the group approaches uh, referencing business development. We do know that uh, savings and loan groups have proven to be very successful uh, and they have ensured community ownership of projects in fact, they are serving as a as an exit strategy for our programs as we pull out of communities. Uh, these women are actually using these groups to sustain the gains that have been made. Uh, we do see the case of organizational strengthening. We've worked with uh, farming cooperatives and, and farming groups to strengthen their organizational development and leadership skills. And this has resulted in some significant change in terms of their potential for opportunities. Uh, community savings and credit uh, corporations uh, have also uh, been worked on and they are enabling, for example, the communities and the women to actually uh, have access to uh, formal financial services, given the fact that we do have in some communities limited access to or no access at all to financial services. Um, there has been a combination of access to finance and of course with the opportunity for women to be able to organize themselves uh, and then there's also the case of women's groups becoming more formalized in, in the countries, more opportunities uh, have been opened up to them. And uh, the importance of saving groups have demonstrated uh, the role that they are playing and it actually, it's actually enabling women and their families to be more resilient to the case of COVID-19, uh, which we are uh, experiencing. Um, with the multiple uh, positive impacts, which is basically outside of increased income, and, and, and what we've been able to document. This was one strong finding from across all of the countries uh, with consideration for sustainability and of course for the group approaches. Uh, at this point, I, I, will, I, will, I will hand it over to Beatrice for her to uh, provide more information around these impacts. Thank you. Thank you, Ramon. I really condensed my the presentation on uh, outcome one and three. Uh, okay, yeah, we before, completed. So, okay, so all right, I will move over so to I'm through, the. I'm done. Thank you. Okay. Over to uh, you or Samin. Okay. Okay. So uh, on the uh, presentation on uh, outcome four, uh, we were able to uh, find out from the evaluation across five countries. Uh, within the context of strengthening gender responsive policy environments. Uh, we do know that in Guatemala, uh, there was the setup of the first institutional policy on gender equality with the Ministry of Agriculture. And we also know that there's a national gender unit that was set up in, in that ministry. 
in Liberia, we were able to support the revision of the national gender policy, uh, which now runs between 2018 and 2022, but we've also made significant contribution to the creation and the passage of the Land Rights Act in Liberia. In Ethiopia, uh, there has been the creation of a national network for gender equality. And of course, that is within the agriculture sector. And in Niger, we do know that there is the International Day of uh, Women, which has been institutionalized. This has resulted in secure collaboration with two ministries putting this agenda uh, at the national level. In Nepal, uh, there is the development of the gender equality and social inclusion strategy uh, that is within the context of agricultural development strategy in that, in that country. Uh, next slide, please. So moving on, uh, we do know that uh, in support of uh, integration with national systems, uh, uh, the evaluation also was able to find out that there is definitely integration of national system, which has ensured ownership and of course has strengthened uh, sustainability. In Ethiopia, we do know that the implementation uh, has been through local government and has involved 26 government institutions. Uh, in Rwanda, there has been an alignment with uh, pre-existing services and community structures at that level. In Niger, there's a decentralized agriculture and veterinary services involving capacity building and monitoring at that country level. In Liberia, we do know that there has been coordinated and government structures at county and district level. Uh, so we do have the county and district agriculture offices at county level, the gender county offices that have been worked with, the service centers, which is basically uh, part of the decentralization process wherein women can access services around land rights, information, whatever the case might be from those areas. Uh, in Guatemala, uh, there's also the case of agriculture technologies that have taken up, uh, been taken up by the Ministry of Agriculture. Next slide, please. Moving forward on partnerships, we do know that this has been critical to the program implementation and uh, this goes from, for across all of the countries. Uh, we were able to build synergies with governments, civil society, the private sector and the grassroots women's networks at all levels. Uh, and through partnership building, we now know that uh, beneficiaries and the government uh, were linked. Uh, and of course, because of the strategies, new partnerships uh, outside of the, the joint program were forged. Uh, for example, uh, targeted women, smallholder farmers under the joint program uh, are currently being linked to the UN Women Buy From Women uh, digital platform for access to information, finance, and market. We are also currently uh, working in partnership uh, at country level with uh, FAO and the World Food Program around uh, the plans for developing digital solutions for improving women's smallholders farmers resilience to natural disasters with support from Innovation Norway. Next slide. On the lessons learned, we do know that coordination uh, during the joint program has helped reduce duplication across countries. Uh, we are also aware that we need to, uh, there's a need for even stronger coordination efforts and mechanisms to be put in place moving forward. Uh, climate resilience, of course, is a priority moving forward. And uh, this is going to assist uh, in mitigating the impacts of uh, climate change in the agricultural sector, but of course, looking at how that impacts food and nutrition security, and of course, increased income. Uh, uniformity of uh, monitoring evaluation programming is critical. Uh, and this will definitely enable the possibility of uh, comparison across countries uh, moving forward, especially now looking at the second phase of the joint program. Thank you. Thank you very much um, to both of you for those very insightful and inspiring discussion of the results from the first phase of the joint program. And these are precisely the kinds of lessons learned, good practices, and uh, the data, evidence, and knowledge um, about rural women's economic empowerment that will allow us to inform and shape the second phase of this program. And in that light, I would like to um, invite 
and welcome Susan Caria, Senior Gender Office Officer for FAO, and Theodora Frisk, Program Manager at the Unit for Globally Sustainable Economic Development for the CEDA, to kick us off in a consideration of uh, the findings and lessons, good practices, and so on from the first phase, um, and how we can build on these learnings of um, to take the program forward in the future. So um, please, I would like to invite um, Susan to kick us off. Thank you very much, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, you've been listening to a lot of the impacts of the program and this was a joint program and we generated a lot of learning. And it's been very exciting for us to see our theory of change pathways being validated, but we've also been able to identify areas which we will apply for the next phase. I think the main message is that we must ensure that the program continues to respond to the challenges facing rural women. So let me start, uh, I want to talk about two major areas where we've, we've found out who are really important going forward. Uh, the first one is monitoring and evaluation. That was a key lesson for us. And it was clear that we need to ensure that uh, our monitoring and evaluation systems capture the true extent of the impacts that were achieved by the program. And we, we actually found out that we were not as ready in terms of capturing these impacts. I mean, for example, Amir talked about the kinds of impacts and, and uh, Beatrice as well talked about uh, the evaluation actually showed consistently about some of the impacts in terms of women's leadership, uh, women's self-confidence that, that had grown, women were contributing to decision-making at the household, at their community. And, uh, and really we did not capture these to the fullest extent. So in the next phase, it's going to be really critical for us to understand to what extent these changes were structural. And also that these changes actually allow women to make decisions beyond the, their usual traditional uh, spheres of influence. And that they are, and we would really like to monitor that these changes are sustainable and they do not change when the circumstances for women change. Uh, secondly, um, imp the improved data collection would really allow us to to see to what extent uh, the issues of intersectionality have been addressed. As you know, rural women are not a homogeneous group and uh, they face multiple and intersecting uh, constraints and forms of discrimination. So when you think about women living with HIV AIDS, women living with disabilities, uh, young women, older women, all these uh, really face different circumstances. And we know that these women were included in our programs but we did not capture it very well. So we really must ensure that our monitoring and evaluation systems capture how they're included and how they're impacted by the program. And then as the program was evolving, and you've heard this from Beatrice, uh, we started to apply these gender transformative approaches in, in order to address the root causes of gender inequalities so, so that we can address the social cultural norms, the perceptions that keep women behind. However, this was again another area that we didn't capture very well. So in the next phase, we really want, uh, we really want to capture how these approaches make a difference. Number one, we also want to make sure that they are an integral part of the program going forward. The second area that, uh, and Ramon touched on this uh, in his, uh, uh, his slides, it was the area of partnerships. Our learning around partnerships is critically important. Uh, this was, as we said, this was a pilot uh, program that involved multiple partnerships at the country level, but also at the HQ level. And, uh, and in the early years, there was a lot of learning around what was working, what was not working, what did we need to change? And as you know, each of the agencies actually brought in their own uh, comparative advantage their own expertise. And we have learned from each other. Uh, and we have, uh, we have actually seen how the approaches are taken up by our agencies. We have also done a lot of cross-fertilization 
uh, of these approaches across countries. <clears throat> However, we would like to do a lot more uh, on this in the next phase. Sorry. We would like to do a lot more on this in the next phase. Uh, it is also clear that some of the, our strongest results stemmed from countries where uh, they had established very strong partnerships on the ground. So for example, you heard about Niger with the Dimitra clubs, as you, as, and you will also hear again from one of our speakers, we had extremely strong partnerships with the government and implementing partners. This was part of what we saw in the results. We also saw that, uh, we've also seen that where coordination was fragmented and the agencies were working independent and there wasn't a strong collaboration and they were working in silos, this also impacted the results on the ground. Over to you, Theodora. Thank you so much, Susan. And uh, I'd really like to take you up on two points here. The first one being global learning and uh, the second one being ownership and working with government. Um, from CEDA's perspective, we truly believe that this program holds the potential to influence other actors and governments beyond the program uh, and contribute to ad advocacy and policy dialogue on women's economic empowerment globally. And as you mentioned, Susan, one of the important results coming out of the first phase is actually le the learnings and the way that they have shaped implementation of the program over the years. Uh, and it's important to note that the program has evolved over time, adjusting to ever-changing contexts, but also changing from experiences and learnings from carrying out this program and also from collaborating uh, between the, the UN agencies. And I mean, indeed, if we look back to 2014 and the inception phase, contexts have certainly changed since then. Um, and from CEDA's point of view, we cannot, uh, nor do we want to, have UN joint uh, programs on rural women's economic empowerment being set up across the globe. Uh, rather, we see this program as, um, we, we see that this program can have an effect beyond the immediate implementation in the program countries. We hear from our partner co countries all over that there is strong commitment, ownership and ambition to start and continue building on efforts uh, uh, aiming to strengthen uh, women's economic empowerment. And this program has a potential to play a crucial role in that by, for example, sharing learnings, producing guidance, sharing, um, even working as a blueprint for how to go about and working with these questions. So we're really pleased to see how the program based on the foundation that has been established during this first phase really now aims at uh, spreading learnings even further and practices to strengthen women's economic empowerment in other settings as well. And we, I mean, we have seen that during the first phase. So for example, in Liberia, where training curricula and training materials were produced uh, for the program, this has been taken up by the European Union. We've also seen in Kyrgyzstan, Nepal, and Niger, uh, that program activities that relate to self-help self, self groups, Dimitra clubs, and GALS, the Gender Action Learning System, uh, have been replicated by other actors, and that is that is really what we would like to see more of. Um, and then secondly, in response to uh, Susan's point on working with local government and ownership, uh, one area that was highlighted in the evaluation is uh, that transforming local government and decentralized government structures is key for sustainability. And in the next phase, we need to do more of this. Um, local ownership is, of course, a prerequisite for this program, as with any other program, um, but it's important to look beyond alignment with national policies and ambitions and to look uh, that there is ownership and systems in place to ensure that policies are complied to, policies actually affect um, practices. Uh, so this is instrumental for the outcomes achieved so far and going future. So just to, to wrap up, uh, we really look forward to seeing more guidance and learnings and knowledge coming out of the program and this continued focus on strong ownership and collaboration with local governments. Uh, and we're eager to see how this will be um, really strengthened in the second phase. Thanks. 
thanks so much to both of you, Susan and Theodora, for demonstrating um, the flexibility of this joint program and its capacity since its inception to adapt to changing circumstances, but also to learn from its own um, experiences and uh, interim results of implementation um, and to work at all levels, local, national, and global, and partnerships at those levels in order to produce the results that we've been discussing. Um, and we have seen how both of you have um, pointed to how uh, this program has been able to influence um, other partners um, and programs and other approaches. Um, so that it has already been replicated and had a, a strong influence that way. Um, so, but turning to the second phase, how can we um, ensure that the, this joint program, which really is a jewel of collaboration and cooperation, um, can continue to go from strength to strength um, and to address the very challenging um, context for rural women's economic empowerment today and going forward. So um, what are some of the, the ways that you would seek um, to address those challenges and, pro and problems and barriers as we move forward? Susan? Thank you. Thank you, Simin. Um, so we've seen very clearly that uh, the, the evaluation found that the program had contributed to food security and nutrition. However, in the next phase of the program, it's going to be really important to move women from subsistence production and to create conditions that enable them to move further up along the value chain, where it's more profitable, where they can make more money. Um, and, uh, and really, this is going to be a big focus because it was one of the places we found needed strengthening. So we, we have learned to do this, although we do have some good examples, we've learned that to do this, there are several elements that are going to be important. So along with thinking about better access to information, knowledge, training, productive resources, financial services, inputs, technologies, it's going to be really important for us to think about women's work burden. And uh, this is in terms of women's care burden, domestic work and in the productive sphere. And this is, it's really important to make sure that whatever interventions we bring do not add to women's work burden. And we think ways to do this is going to be through gender transformative approaches that allow us to work with men and women to redistribute some of the tasks, but also the adoption of uh, climate smart technologies and practices. Second, uh, women must also have access to decent employment opportunities. And we've seen through the program some very innovative examples. I think uh, um, they were also mentioned by Ramon, uh, which showed women breaking out of traditional female roles and developing innovative business ideas, and also accessing decent work through private sector partnerships. We think this is another area that we need to grow going forward that really expand the opportunities through better linkages with private sector. The third area is we also saw, particularly in the last year of the program, how breaching the gender digital divide for rural women has actually led to increased opportunities for business development and income generation. This again is another area we'd like to build in going forward in a very intentional way. Over to you, Theodora. Thank you very much. Um, I second everything you said, Susan. And uh, I'd like to come in and say, uh, again, I mean, we've talked about the, uh, the importance of having such a holistic approach to strengthening women's economic empowerment. And uh, we believe that is so necessary to keep on going. Uh, because as, as has already been mentioned, the nature of this is so complex. It depends on institutional as well as social structures, power dynamics, power relations, access, uh, agency, and we need to work with everyone, including uh, men. Um, and changing this is, is difficult, um, really. 
And uh, I mean, yes, and we've also heard a lot of speakers talking about how the pandemic is drastically affecting gender equality globally, risking social economic gains and uh, the risk that already large gender gaps that uh, persisted even before the crisis are even worsened. So it has become clear how vulnerable development gains are. And evidently, this has been the case for the program as well. So in addition to serious effects caused in the recent year by the pandemic, you know, due to lockdowns, uh, greatly reduced economic activity, increased gender-based violence, increased uh, burden of care and unpaid work, disruptions and value chains, we also have climate change seriously affecting the world we live in. And we've seen this, this in the past year, where the program's target group have faced multiple serious shocks. And this really sheds light on the importance of resilience as part of women's empowerment that, should, that needs to be addressed within this program in order to have this holistic approach. So we need to continue to see the full picture. Uh, we need to continue adjusting to changing contexts. And these new prerequisites uh, require new approaches. So um, one thing that has been mentioned is the need for digitalization. It's become clear uh, now in the pandemic that um, the need and potential for digital solutions and tools as an enabler for women's economic empower empowerment uh, is evident. And uh, we cannot afford to, to include all of those new technologies in order to move forward. Um, so really uh, just to wrap up this, type of holistic view and innovative approach that we see in this program, they're necessary to create lasting change. And we at CEDA truly hope that other donors will join forces with us in this continued work to strengthening women's economic empowerment globally uh, and scaling what works in the second phase. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed to both Susan and Theodora for their insights and valuable reflections and pointing the way forward. Um, we're especially um, uh, keen to see how the joint program can both build climate resilience and resilience to other kinds of, the, of shocks and emergencies that may arise in the future um, and how important it is for rural women and their communities to undertake that resilience building, but at the same time being mindful of not increasing uh, women's unpaid care and domestic um, workloads, and uh, also looking at to innovative approaches, um, including um, digitalization to be able to affect the kinds of transformative and long lasting change that this program um, seeks to um, obtain. So um, as has been pointed out by um, Beatrice, Ramon, Susan, and Theodora, this joint program would not have been possible without the continued dedication and ongoing efforts of national governments and ministries and implementing partners. Um, and this has been critical to ensuring that the work that goes on has fruitful and, uh, and, and, and results and at both the policy and grassroots levels. So um, in that context, we welcome Dr. Ibrahim Bangana, Technical Counselor to the Minister of, Ag Minister of Agriculture and Livestock in Niger, and uh, Asel Kutabaeva, um, Program Manager for Community Development Alliance, a joint program implementing partner in Kyrgyzstan, to, to share their experiences and perspectives on the key results and the way forward um, of the joint program. So um, thank you to both of you for joining us today. And Dr. Ibrahim, may I start with you, please? You have been involved in the program in Niger since its inception. So that is basically commitment and dedication and hard work over many years. So what in your view as a government representative has made this program work and what has, have been some of the reasons for its success? Over to you, Dr. Ibrahim.
Dr. Abraham, would you like to to begin? Uh, merci. Thank you. Uh, Permettez-moi tout d'abord uh, de remercier all, thank les agences uh, des Nations Unies UN uh, qui ont conçu ce programme conjoint uh, program de l'autonomisation des femmes. For, uh, Je remercie aussi uh, women, la Norvège et like la Suède qui sont des ailleurs de fonds that are donor conjoint. countries for this joint program. De succès Regarding the success conjoint of this joint program pays, in my country, it is causes. mostly due to La two, for two reasons. The first, the joint program au niveau de toutes les politiques has et stratégies nationales been embraced en at all national policies uh, regarding gender, not only at the level femme, of the Ministry for the Promotion of Women, but also for the Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock, where de ces et all of the programs and strategies de deal with women, economic empowerment, and take it into account. The second reason is that la coordination with regard to conjoint. the coordination Donc, uh, of the joint program, there a is a system that has been implemented, le comité technique, for example, at the technical committee level, there is an exchange platform uh, where surtout, all of the stakeholders travail, are active and collaborating, and there's a very good collaboration with the decentralized technical services. This has enabled us to get the result that we have been able to see at the evaluation of the program. With regards to the program conjoint a eu un effet très us, positif là où les interventions effect. ont eu lieu. Donc, la première des choses, c'est uh, de répliquer First, uh, cette expérience qui est une expérience très bénéfique au profit des femmes. La deuxième chose, c'est que Second, il y a dans le cadre des activités qui sont menées notamment With les micro-entreprises tenues par les femmes, il faut les améliorer et les mettre en relation avec euh, les milieux urbains. And La troisième chose, nous sommes dans un pays sahélien soumis au changement climatique. We are Donc, in il faut a salient country with climate change issues, and de, this must be integrated and incorporated into our activities. Maintenant, Et nous avons fait déjà des forats now, au niveau des communes pour recueillir les avis des bénéficiaires. Et très bientôt, un forum national sera convoqué avec toutes les parties prenantes pour donner une orientation définitive so sur la deuxième phase en tenant compte des Voilà, en tout cas, je vous remercie en tout cas davantage, so, et notamment le PAM, l'ONU, and especially et WFP, UN Women, les qui sont en train IFAD de faire and AFAO for all the efforts that they did. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Um, uh, Dr. Ibrahim, for um, your reflections and your um, assessment of what has allowed this program to work in Niger uh, for the benefit of rural women's economic empowerment and uh, that of their communities and the challenges that uh, face us moving forward, particularly climate change and other crises um, that may come. Um, 
So in that context, may I ask you, how can we sustain this work going forward? And how can we ensure that the joint program's impact is durable and sustainable? In order to be sustainable for us, it is very important the participation with the local authorities, uh, the villages and the municipalities is absolutely essential because the results that we have that are tangible results Sorry. I thought there was a technical Donc, problem. Je disais que so I was saying that la durabilité, in order to be sustainable, participative, we need to have a participative approach and also at the decentralized au, level. Au niveau des communes, so at the level of the communities and the villages. Thank you so much, Dr. Ibrahim, for your further uh, words of guidance um, as we move forward. And now I would like to turn to um, uh, Asel Kutabaeva, and um, I would like to hear about your experiences um, with the joint program from the grassroots and um, to ask about how it has enabled transformative change working with women and men, especially to, to challenge traditional gender norms. Um, can you please talk to us about um, some of these issues from your perspective um, in Kyrgyzstan? Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, yes, sure. I'm happy to share our experience. Uh, uh, we used uh, GALS, Gender Action Learning System, uh, in order to promote gender equality through social uh, norms transformation, uh, because um, it is a, um, it, it's a community-led empowerment methodology that effectively supports um, comprehensive livelihood planning, gender justice, and social transformation process uh, fully based on participatory approach. It was first introduced uh, in 2016 by IFAT uh, within joint program and inspired by um, serious um, potential of this methodology to tackle the social norms and um, um, put away the structured barriers that refrain women and girls from in inclusion and uh, participation. Uh, we, uh, we are still continuing to scale it up and to roll out uh, because the response to the need of triggering and uh, consolidating gender changes uh, within household and community and also ensuring sustainability of results of joint program. Uh, since then, uh, we have covered more than 20,000 rural women and their household members. Uh, within the joint program and not only within the joint program, but also with other projects. And also uh, we, um, uh, 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 we are proud to say that uh, with the help of uh, this first introduction of girls uh, in uh, Central Asia and Kyrgyzstan, uh, with positive results we have, now we are starting uh, scaling it up in our neighboring countries such as Tajikistan and Uzbekistan. Uh, actually, we uh, use uh, this methodology uh, as a key strategy to achieve um, corporate commitment to bring about gender transformat uh, transformative results, transformation uh, of gendered power dynamics uh, by addressing social norms, practices, attitudes and behavior and system of um, values that represent structural barrier for women and girls for their inclusion and empowerment. Empowerment begins uh, by engaging family members uh, to promote household efficiency into a participatory and fun process 
where they use drawing, dancing, songs, um, um, diagrams, and dramas. This is how people get open for um, learning, adaptation, changes, and transformation. Uh, so, Ian, uh, as for the impact uh, and adding value that we saw for the joint program and uh, development intervention um, overall, uh, we see that um, social norms or cultural um, problem, uh, norms are the key um, and root causes of disempowerment of women. And we see that without having social empowerment, we cannot uh, claim for sustainable economic and political empowerment of women. And that is why we see that this was one of the key uh, values uh, of the joint program that, uh, that made us to see more sustainable results. Uh, we see that um, join, uh, girls helps uh, to develop uh, motivation to change and uh, to act immediately without waiting for somebody to change their lives. It also, uh, in, a, uh, in, in the impact level, we see that women became uh, more active uh, and leaders on social, economic and political spheres at the household and community levels because um, we see that uh, women um, are more respected, supported uh, to be active, uh, to, um, to participate in decision-making processes in resource allocation. Um, and also they are helped by family members to carry out uh, their household uh, duties uh, and also uh, they are supported do their um, business or income generating activities they used to do uh, before on their own. Now we see that uh, their husbands and other household members are trying to support to carry out unpaid care uh, work and also to do um, income generation activities. Uh, we see that um, women's uh, burden uh, to carry out household activities, uh, um, productive and rep reproductive duties is reduced as um, their practical and strategic needs were recognized and addressed. And uh, also uh, with the support of their family members, now they are more uh, free to participate in uh, trainings in seminars where they can develop their knowledge and skills in order to be more productive and also to be more active in uh, economic sphere. We also see that girls' uh, tools helped uh, women and um, uh, their household members uh, to find more innovative, uh, profitable and sustainable businesses and to carry it out uh, together with other household members. And of course, um, another dimension of change we noted is that reduce of domestic violence as a result of uh, all the above mentioned um, changes I, uh, I said before. Also, we see that women became more confident, self-confident, and they have developed critical thinking and communication skills, and um, um, besides business and financial management skills. So this is in, um, in brief. So if you have questions, so I'm happy to respond. Thank you. Thank you so much, Asel. And we are um, unfortunately running um, um, way over time. And we have time for one question before we close the program for today. So I'd like to thank both you, Asel, and Dr. Ibrahim for your um, uh, interventions. And um, I would like to move to one, a, a couple of questions that have been um, asked directed to Susan on targeting um, which uh, what informs program decisions on who to work with and for how long, and on indices, which ones are used across different countries to measure gender equality and women's holistic um, economic empowerment. Susan, I'll give you one minute before we have to move on to uh, closing remarks. I'm, I apologize. Please go ahead. I, I will try to speak really fast now. Um, so on the question on targeting, this, this was a multi-layered decision. We had to take many considerations. And the first one was mapping the needs, where are the most vulnerable and food insecure women are located. 
So in, in Ethiopia, we work with pastoralist women, in Guatemala, indigenous women amongst others. So really making sure that we were reaching the most, the, the most in need. The second part of the targeting was making sure that all the four agencies were working in the country and they had a comparative advantage and they had implementation capacities. So this was another uh, very important uh, criteria for the targeting. And the third it was the government's interest. So that the, the program uh, really aligned with the priorities of the government as expressed in their road development and gender equality strategies. And going forward, these are definitely the lessons we have learned and we will use this criteria. On the issue of indices, very quickly, I just want to say that one of the most useful tools we have been using is uh, called the Women's Empowerment in Agriculture Index. And actually we worked together with the International Food Policy Research Institute in developing a tool called the Project Level Women's Empowerment in Agriculture Index that looks at to what extent women are empowered and across several areas. And these are, this is a tool that has been applied in more than 50, 60 countries. So it is, it, it is usable and it can be found. But the idea is to look at what kinds of, uh, to what level do women make decisions? To what, to what level do they contribute to decisions around what is produced? To what uh, extent do they make decisions on ownership of land and other assets or do they own them? How is the income? Who controls the use of income? Are women able to control the use of their income? Access to and decisions over financial resources. Who makes a decision about whether a loan is taken and how it's used? Big issue, and I highlighted it before, women's work burden. To what extent is a program increasing or decreasing women's work burden? Group membership, uh, self-confidence and self-efficacy, which is measured through a belief in one's ability or capabilities to reach his or her goals, attitudes towards gender-based violence, but also things such as respect uh, among household members. And th this is a really useful tool because using it, you can actually look uh, at these different dimensions and see to which one is contributing to women's disempowerment. And you can use that to tweak the program as needed. Uh, we have done uh, a global uh, study that has looked at, um, that has used the Women's Empowerment in Agriculture Index in all the countries. And we are actually preparing a synthesis report even as we speak, and it will be ready in the next couple of months. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan. And now I would like to um, introduce Maike van Ginneken, who is the Associate Vice President for Strategy and Knowledge Development at IFAD for closing remarks. Um, uh, please, Maike, you have the floor. Thank you very much. And thank you to all the speakers for sharing your experiences and your reflections with us. Thanks to CEDA and our colleagues of the Rome Raised Agencies and UN Women participating in the joint program. But a special thanks to those who brought uh, stories and experiences from the front line from different countries around the world. You truly inspired me. Thank you for that. We've heard today that advancing the empowerment of rural women is best achieved through integrated approaches because they face multiple challenges and we need to create an enabling environment. We need to support women's ability to make decisions, to reduce their workloads, to have access to land, natural resources and means of production, and to live free from violence. We want women to be able to act upon their dreams and their aspirations. This is not done in purely technical and narrow sectoral dimensions. I'm very inspired by the stories I heard today about the joint program and the power of partnership. We combined our expertise and capitalized on our individual agency strength. I think we also recognize today that partnerships takes commitment and it takes time. We've grown together over these three years, these years of implementation. Let's celebrate that. We have led the way in developing a successful partnership model in the spirit of One UN. And I'm very happy that we now look forward to building on the social 
capital we build between our agencies as we bring this partnership in a second phase. The joint program has had an impact on the specific countries we've worked in, and I was very nice, it was very nice to hear about this, but I also would like to underline what Theodora Fresk of CEDA said today, that the impact must go and goes beyond these countries already. We're learning together, we're developing blueprints for other communities and countries to act and to act more quickly. Today we have been, we've had an opportunity to reflect and to celebrate on the process that we've made in advancing gender equality and women's empowerment. The past year has been hard on women around the world. A lot of you have referred to it. Women stand at the front lines of the COVID crisis as healthcare workers, caregivers, innovators, community organizers, and as some of the most exemplary and effective national leaders in combating the pandemic. The crisis has both highlighted the centrality of the contribution of women and the disproportional burden that women carry. Let's be proud of all the women around the world of how they've helped us through this pandemic and we're not yet through it, so we will need that female leadership going forward. And all of this has been done with often having kids home at school, homeschooling kids, and uh, facing domestic violence and unemployment. Actually, some of you with your cameras off might be with your children at the very moment we speak today. So let's celebrate the heroes of the COVID response, and let's move forward as we get out of this pandemic and work on ensuring that women's empowerment contributes to inclusive and sustainable food systems, that women have access to decent work and that they have the means to demonstrate resilience in a challenging world. The joint program is well placed to continue to contribute to these ambitions. And we stand ready as role-based agencies, as you and women and the other partners in this program to scale it up successful, uh, successfully and to scale up the practices and the working modalities that we've invested in much in the past few years. So we would like to thank the governments of Sweden and Norway for their ongoing support to this program. And I've seen there's some other development partners online. So to those of you who are online and spread the word, please come on board and join us in supporting the joint program together. We need to work together in advancing the cause of gender equality and women's empowerment. And I think if today has shown one thing, it's that the joint program can play a central role in this going forward. It's been great right till now, but there's much work to be done and we want to scale up. So on behalf of the partners, we look forward to engaging together with new potential partners and to join forces for rural women with the urgency and the importance that is required. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Maike, for bringing us to a close. Uh, and uh, thank you everyone for participating and for your wonderful um, uh, uh, comments, reflections, as we move from the first to the second phase of the program. Thank you all and goodbye for now. <laughs>